So I really again want to thank uh, Serena for the very kind uh, invitation and putting up this uh, great uh, course. With I think it's really important uh, for everybody to hear what what you know different people are doing. So I'll drop my uh, two cents uh, today and uh, show you what what we are uh, uh, doing. And I'll talk about as an example of, uh, our work on the extracellular signal regulated kinases or er kinases in hypertrophy and heart failure. So we know that the heart can respond differentially to different types of work overload. So when the heart faces pressure overload, like we see in patients with uh, uh, hypertension or aortic valve stenosis, the heart responds in a, in a growth pattern which we call concentric hypertrophy uh, that is characterized by increase in the, in the wall thickness. Uh, in contrast, when the heart faces volume overload, like we see, for example, in patients with uh, mitral valve uh, uh, leak, uh, the heart responds in a growth pattern, which we call eccentric hypertrophy, uh, that it characterized by increasing the diameter of the left ventricle, uh, usually without an increase, sometimes with even thinning of the ventricular uh, walls. When either of these conditions is... Uh, prolonged, that is, whenever we have prolonged pressure overload or prolonged over, uh, uh, volume overload, uh, the function of the heart deteriorates over time, and eventually we get heart failure. I think it's also uh, important to, to remember, to acknowledge that these macroscopic uh, changes are a result of changes that occur at the cardiomyocyte cell level. So, when the cardiomyocyte senses pressure <coughs> overload, it responds by adding new sarcomeric units in parallel. This results in thickening of the cardiomyocytes, and this results in the microscopic pattern of concentric hypertrophy. And in contrast, when the cardiomyocyte senses volume overload, it responds by adding new sarcomeric units in series. This results in elongation of the cardiomyocyte, and this results in a macroscopic pattern of eccentric hypertrophy. And, and I and my lab were very interested in understanding the molecular control of this differential growth decision to understand how the uh, uh, cardiomyocyte handles the sarcomers and why eventually we get heart failure. Well, of course, echocardiography is extremely useful to assess all these changes in the wall thickness and the dimension of the ventricle and uh, in the function of the heart. In the mouse, uh, we most often use the parasternal views. You've seen this slide already. Uh, either the parasternal long axis or the perpendicular uh, short axis view, and from them we can also use M mode and to get measurements of the wall thickness and uh, chamber uh, uh, diameter and, and the fractional shortening. And since these views are uh, perpendicular to, to one another, as I think Dieter mentioned. Measurements in M mode should be exactly the same from the long axis view and from the short axis view if they are done properly. So if they are done correctly, it, you should get exactly the same uh, measurements. The problem, and, and this is for both views, that you have to make sure that you are indeed uh, viewing the heart from the correct plane. So this is an example of the long axis view of the heart. If you look from above, this would be the left ventricle and this would be the aorta. Of course, the correct plane runs in the middle of the left ventricle and cuts through the aorta. And you do not want to image the heart in one of these gray off-axis uh, diagonal views. And, and one of the issues that just by looking at the image, it, it can sometimes be difficult to know that you are exactly in the correct view, because just on this example that I've, I've shown, in any of these diagonal off-axis view, you'd see something that looks like an apex. And uh, you, you can also often see parts of the aorta. Uh, so you really have to make sure that you are in the correct angle. As I think Dieter pointed out, one clue, for example, if the apex is moving, then you know that you are not in the correct, that what you're seeing is a false apex. So just so if you see something that looks like this, does not mean it's the true apex. As you see, all of these views will give you something like this. And once uh, uh, you are uh, 
in the middle of the ventricle. If you want to make emerald measurements, you have to make sure that your plane of view is parallel to the short axis view of the heart. And again, you do not want one of these a diagonal off-axis view. This is just another, another example. So the red is the correct view, and uh, the black is an incorrect view. So if you start from the long axis view and you turn by 90 degrees, you should get to the short axis view of the heart. And we, uh, in a, at least non-infarcted heart, we want to see the heart as a sort of a, a circle, sphere, and we want to see two uh, papillary muscles that are roughly equal in size and symmetric. If you don't see papillary muscles, uh, it means you're too low toward the apex. If you see something elliptical and very, uh, to the very asymmetric papillary muscles, you're probably at an off-axis view. And uh, so, so you have to uh, make sure. In, in both views, you also have to make sure that you are measuring the left ventricle and not the papillary muscles, which can sometimes you know, put, protrude into the, uh, to the image. Uh, this is just one example of this. So this is the papillary muscle. It's exactly you know, in the middle of the plane. Um, so if you, uh, if you make an M-mode measurement, and uh, sometimes you can see when you measure from here to here, you're measuring the papillary muscle. Okay? So the, the endocardial side uh, is, is here. Right? It's, this is the papillary muscle that you're measuring. So, uh, it's, it's trivial, but again, uh, you have to do it right. So, uh, what, what do you think about this image? Anybody? Good? Not good? So, it's not good, right? It's, it's elliptical. The papillary muscles are really unequal, and the heart rate is 286. So, not good. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a clue that you are not, not, not doing it right. And at least as a, both a clinical and a mouse echocardiographer, I look at the art, I look at the function. If the function looks normal and I get a number that show it's abnormal, then I look for, for, uh, for, for, for I, I look to adjust it. I, look, I try again, I look, uh, what did I do wrong? Uh, and, and vice versa. If the heart function is bad and you get numbers that show you it's good, uh, probably did something wrong. This is this is a better. The heart rate is still low. It's 370. It's a bit. This is just re same image. Just reduce the anesthesia. And you wait for the heart rate to go up. But this is now papillary muscles are more equal. And, and if you want, you can make uh, measurements. But it's it's still better to wait until the heart rate goes up. So again, our, our, my, my two cents, so we use either the parasternal log or the short axis view. Both should be okay as long as you are sure that you are in the correct plane. We also prefer to start in the long and move to the short and then make the measurement, then we feel uh, better. Heated pad, isofluorin, no more than 1.5%, but really titrated to the heart rate. So it's not the actual percentage, but it's the heart rate that counts. Heart rate should be at least 350, but above 450, I think it is a better criteria. But you have to report it. So, so if you read human you know, patients, clinical uh, echo textbooks and manual, they will tell you that in 25% of the patient, you cannot reach a true angle to make a mode measurements. Mm -hmm. And this is my inter feeling also as a clinical cardiologist. In 25% of the patients, we don't report uh, measurements because the heart is oblique, uh, because of chest wall or some structure. That you just cannot get. And then we don't report uh, the numbers. And my feeling as a mouse echocardiographer are similar. So up to maybe one in four mice, you cannot get real accurate uh, measurements. And at least the philosophy I was raised on is that uh, no measurement, it's much better than a bad measurement. And uh, although we have small mice group and with an eye and tuck and we already lost some mice to, die, to death, it's, it's a pity to give up maybe one in four mice, but again, you don't want uh, bad data. So if you, if you, if you want numbers, my, my boss would tell me go to the phone directory. You can find a lot of numbers in there. Uh, but if you want actual measurements and, and you cannot get the good data, just, just don't do it. 
We do three independent measurements. I use it by hand, so I, I make the measurement. I take off the transducer, I put it back on, I look for the angle, I make a measurement again, I do it three times. And I, again, it's already a lot of people say, you cannot underestimate the importance of blinding. As an echocardiographer, we tell you I can give you any number you want. You want a chamber of four, I can give you four. You want five, I can give you five. You want six, you know, just by tilting the transducer. So we, we do it as blindly as I don't even get the mouse number when I do the echoes, I just put the mouse, mouse X I do, so I will not remember anything from uh, anything. So blinding is really essential. So a few words just on, on how we use this. Uh, so we are interested in the, in the role of, the extra, of ERK signaling in, in the differential growth response, and this is a kinase cascade. And like the map kinase cascade, it has three main levels. At the upper level, we find several protein kinases, uh, some from the RAF uh, family and others. When they get activated, uh, they phosphorylate uh, a lower level. Uh, two proteins uh, we can find here are MEC1 and MEC2. When they get phosphorylated, they get activated, and they phosphorylate the downstream kinases of the pathway. These are, again, two proteins, ERK1 and ERK2. When they are phosphorylated, they get activated. They themselves are protein kinases, so they then go on and phosphorylate multiple targets uh, within the cell. And uh, when I was still in, in Jeff Malkinton's lab uh, in the US, uh, uh, we started to look at this, and we started with a loss of function approach. Uh, so we generated mouse with global deletion of ERK1 and the cardiac myocyte-specific deletion of ERK2. And we did this by a flux ERK2 allele, and we used two different cream mice uh, to delete ERK1 and ERK2 from uh, cardiomyocytes. Uh, when we analyzed this mice, we saw that technically it worked, so you'd eliminate ERK1 and ERK2 from cardiomyocytes. It didn't have a lot uh, or any noticeable effect on the other MAP kinases cascades, on JNK, P38, ERK5. And when we started following these mice, we noticed that they uh, developed hypertrophy, which was manifested, for example, by increasing heart weight, normalized to uh, body weight. So we had two con different control groups uh, in, in white and, and red, and we had two knockout groups. Uh, one in blue is the alpha myosin heavy chain, and in black is the NKX uh, uh, knocking Cree. So you can see that at 60 and 90 days, there's progressive hypertrophy. Uh, they also had activation of the classical gene markers of hypertrophy, the natriuretic peptides, uh, the uh, skeletal isoform of actin, the beta isoform of, uh, of myosin heavy chain. Histology already gave us a clue that this hypertrophy was of the eccentric type. So you can see control mice and knockout mice at 60 and 90 days. And you can see that there is progressive dilation of the ventricle uh, without an increase, even with some thinning of the ventricular walls. Uh, but of course, the proper way to assess this is by echocardiography and, and imaging. So we did this. Uh, this is a serial echocardiography. It's 30, 60, and 90 days. This is the chamber diameter. This is the left ventricular and diastolic diameter. And you can see that there is progressive dilation of these uh, uh, ventricles in the knockout mice. And hand in hand with this, we have a progressive decrease in the uh, function, uh, of these, uh, uh, function of these hearts. And we always like to corroborate our findings you know, with additional modalities. So here we used um, invasive hemodynamics, and uh, we use maximal uh, DP to DT as a measure of contractility with escalating dose of dobutamine. And uh, exactly in, in similar to the echo data, we could see decreased contractile function in these, uh, in these hearts. Interestingly, despite the fact that they develop progressive hypertrophy, dilation, and reduced function, we did not see any increase in apoptosis nor of uh, fibrosis. So uh, we concluded that if you have loss of function of ERK, you develop eccentric hypertrophy that gradually uh, progresses to failure. 
Uh, so next we wanted to uh, assess gain of function of the cascade, and here things got a little more complicated. It turns out that in addition to the classical phosphorylation of ERK, which occurs on this trionine and tyrosine, something called the TEY motif on ERK, so in, the, in addition to this dual phosphorylation, ERK can autophosphorylate itself on the adjacent trionine. This is called uh, trionine 207 in ERK1 and 188 on ERK2, because ERK1 is a bit longer. Why is it important? Because uh, the study, uh, the group that discovered uh, this phosphorylation, has shown that in human failing heart, we get activation of the ERK cascade. And this activation is both the classical phosphorylation of the TY motif and also this additional phosphorylation on ERK1 and 2. So it's really important to understand what's, what's the role of ERK activation that includes the phosphorylation of this, uh, of this uh, trionine. So again, the group that discovered this have generated uh, different mutants of ERK in which they mutated this additional trionine to uh, different amino acids. And uh, one of these amino acids was a trionine to aspartic acid, the T2D mutation, because the side chain of aspartic acid is very similar to a phosphor group. So this T2D mutation is often considered a phosphomimetic gain of function uh, substitution. So then uh, they have uh, overexpressed these mutants in the mouse heart, in transgenic uh, animals, and at baseline there was no phenotype. But when they performed uh, TAC, uh, a transverse aortic constriction to induce pressure overload, they noticed that the mice with a T2D substitution, this gain of function, uh, developed considerably more hypertrophy and on echo uh, uh, considerably reduced uh, fractional shortening. So they have concluded that ERK activation uh, in the context of pressure overload becomes uh, uh, maladaptive uh, with more hypertrophy and more uh, failure. So I'm uh, collaborating with uh, David Engelberg from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and he did a very cool screen. Uh, he's interested in the map, uh, map uh, kinases. Did a very cool uh, screen in yeast. Uh, I don't have time to describe, but I'll just tell you that he found two very interesting things. So uh, in this screen, he found that any mutagenesis on this additional trionine, including the trionine to aspartic acid, kills the kinase activity of ERK. So all these mutants were all kind of dead in this, in this study. So even the gain of function was a loss of function. Uh, the second interesting uh, thing that he found, he found another mutant of ERK. This mutation is a totally different position in the, uh, in the protein. It's an arginine, uh, position 65 on ERK2 and 84 on ERK1 that if, if you uh, mutate it to serine, you get a spontaneously active ERK that is highly catalytically active even in the absence of MEC. Uh, so we were very interested in this uh, uh, ERK mutant, this spontaneously active ERK, uh, because as you can see, it's, it's get phosphorylated and uh, activated on both the TY uh, motif and also on this additional trionine exactly like the, uh, what we see in patients with, with heart failure. And of course, it's highly catalytically active. So we went ahead and generated transgenic mice that overexpressed this uh, active ERK mutant. And uh, we got convinced that these mice are actually excellent tool to assess gain of function of ERK activity. Uh, because like the ERK in, in patients with heart failure, it's phosphorylated on both the TUI and, and on the additional trionine, and the degree of activation is twofold, which is in the range of what we see in patients with heart failure. Um, so we began to study these mice, and we saw that they uh, develop a mild form of concentric hypertrophy. And uh, maybe I'll go back a slide. So uh, just to be clear, on this study, we had control mice. We called them wild-type mice, and I'm show, showing them in white. We have uh, 
Transgenic mice were created using the TET binary system. So what we call the double transgenic animals are the animals that overexpress this active ERK under the control of uh, a myosin heavy chain promoter, and they are shown in black. Numbers just show the number of mice in each group. So we followed these mice, and uh, histology showed that they develop a mild concentric hypertrophy. Heart weight uh, to body weight was uh, uh, increased uh, in two different lines. Diameter of the cardiomyocytes was increased. There was activation of the classical markers of hypertrophy. So they develop a mild form of concentric hypertrophy, uh, even without stress. Uh, also, inter interestingly, like the loss of function of ERK, which the mice develop eccentric hypertrophy, but without increasing fibrosis, the gain of function of ERK, they have a concentric hypertrophy, and again, without an increase in fibrosis, even with a slight decrease in fibrosis uh, relative to uh, normal animals. And, and echocardiography showed us that this was an adaptive form of hypertrophy because even with a long follow-up of 90 days and 180 days, the function of these mice was hypercontractile, was better than control mice. And uh, I want to also to notice that there is variability. So variability is part of nature, I think. Uh, some of it, should, it may be technical, but part of it is intrinsic. And we needed quite a large animal, uh, numbers of animals to see statistically significant uh, 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 changes. So uh, next we wanted to know how these animals behave under pressure uh, overload. So we formed TAC, transfer cell condition. And this indeed resulted in significant hypertrophy and manifested by increasing heart weight and activation of the markers. And you can see that there was both groups developed the equivalent amount of hypertrophy. Uh, so the, after the attack, the heart weight to body weight and the activation of gene markers was equal in both groups. But the interesting thing was, of course, function. So we performed serial echocardiography on these uh, mice uh, for seven weeks uh, after attack, uh, up to 10 weeks uh, after attack, and uh, I'm showing you up, uh, only up to seven. You can see control uh, mice. This is a white circle. Over time, uh, they have a slow deterioration of the function. This is a FEB background, so they don't deteriorate uh, like the C57, but you still see deterioration. In contrast, the uh, double transgenic mice that express the activated ERK maintain their significantly better function throughout this uh, period. And you can see the same thing. This is just internal diameter at systole, which is basically the same thing. But as, as I mentioned, we, we like to corroborate our findings with other modalities. Uh, so here we use the, we have a nine Tesla Brooker MRI. And uh, so we did this analysis uh, at 10 weeks after attack. And uh, MRI is the gold standard for uh, ejection fraction because uh, we do get 3D uh, data, and uh, we actually measure the, the ejection fraction. Uh, usually the imaging is, is, is better than, than what we get in ECHO. And we can always align the heart, because we get real 3D data, to the correct angle. So we, we always measure this, and we got exactly the same result. So we saw significantly better uh, ejection fraction and the data was really highly correlated to the uh, echo data. Um, I think so. This is the wild type mice, and uh, you can see the reduced uh, function, and here you can see the much better function in the transgenic animals. So we were also interested in uh, finding the target, because ERK is a kinase, so what are the targets that ERK phosphorylate that could explain this better contractile function? So we perform a phosphoproteomic study uh, at, at baseline in these mice, and uh, the study uh, identified the topic was phospholambin. And uh, we used a Western blot with antibodies for phosphophospholambin and total phospholambin, and they also showed that phospholambin is uh, excessively hyperphosphorylated in this 
uh, transgenic uh, animals that express ERK. I'm sure we all remember that phospholamine is, is a protein that binds to the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum ATPase pump, so CERCA, and it inhibits it. And when the phospholamine gets phosphorylated, this removes the inhibition, actually activates CERCA, uh, which then pumps more calcium to the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum, and this augments the uh, contractile function. And indeed, when we uh, isolated cardiomyocytes from these control and, and transgenic mice, we could see, we performed calcium imaging, we could see higher calcium transients that are consistent with more circa activity. Uh, so this specific study showed us that in contrast with the loss of function of ERK, which leads to eccentric hypertrophy and eventually to failure, gain of function leads to concentric hypertrophy and uh, actually prevents the deterioration uh, uh, to, uh, to failure. So ERK in our minds acts as a sort of a switch in the cell. So when you activate it, you get more uh, concentric hypertrophy, and when you inhibit this, you get more uh, eccentric hypertrophy. I want just uh, to take a couple of minutes to show you that ECHO is not uh, just useful to assess the structure and function of the heart, but also we can inject uh, to the heart, uh, I wouldn't call it non-invasively, but without the need for surgery. Uh, so in a related project, we are very interested in imaging the site of protein translation to the heart uh, in, in cardiomyocytes. So where are the proteins are actually made in the, in the, in the cardiomyocytes? So for that, we use an amino acid mimetic called OPP, which get integrated to peptide as they are being synthesized by the ribosomes. We can then fluorescently label it and image the site of protein translation. Uh, the way we did this experiment initially was in culture, so we added this OPP mimetic uh, to, um, to the culture medium. We waited 30 minutes. We then fixed the cells, performed the labeling reaction, and imaged. Uh, cardiomyocytes were stained with sarcomeric alpha-actin and antibodies. This is in red. And the uh, nascent peptides are labeled with fluorescent green. So you can see the protein translation is highly localized to the sarcoma. It occurs predominantly at the Z-discs of the cardiomyocytes. But then we wanted to do this thing in vivo. Uh, so we wanted to inject this OPP uh, to the left ventricular wall. Again, we performed similar experiments to the culture one in essence. We injected to the left ventricular wall. We waited 30 minutes. We harvested the heart, cryosectioned them, performed the labeling reaction, and uh, imaged. And uh, this is how we do it. We, we like the short axis again. So this is the short axis view. This is the chest wall, and this is the needle. And you can see it goes up to the uh, inside the left ventricular wall. This is a little more toward the apex. Uh, I think maybe in a movie you can see it better. So you can see, I think the edge of the needle is here. And you see it's inside the wall. If we can see it moving with each contraction, that's a, a, also a good sign that it's, uh, that this is now stuck, but uh, that you are inside. And um, just show you a few more. So this is before. Uh, this is the edge of the needle. You can see it here. This is as we look for a place between the ribs. And here we, uh, the needle is in the right uh, position. It's inside the wall. And uh, after we inject, usually what we inject acts sort of a contrast. So we see, you know, this blurring of the, uh, of the wall, but you still see that contraction is really intact. And once you get the hang of it, this is really easy. With less than 10 minutes, we can anesthetize uh, uh, the mouse, we advance the needle, we inject, we withdraw it. Two minutes later, the mouse is walking on the cage, so we can do six, six animals an hour uh, easily. And um, very few, I mean, we got one tamponade. We managed to inject directly in the pericard, which I think uh, requires special talent because this is uh, a few microns uh, space, but we got this only once. 
Um, sometimes if you're too deep, you just in, in, uh, inject into the left, uh, inside the left NV, which could be useful, for example, if you want to maybe, because we cannot inject intracoronary in mice, so uh, t this, this could be the uh, poor man's alternative uh, in our case. And um, um, so, so it's, it's rather uh, easy to do, and uh, this is how it looks. So it looks exactly like the culture, and we can see that um, uh, protein translation occurs, uh, is really localized to the sarcomer in, in, in cardiomyocytes. Another thing we do, we often mix fluorescent beads uh, in, inside the fluid uh, that we inject, and they are uh, inertic, so they don't do anything. You can see them here. But it's really useful if you then have cryosection of the heart and you have lots of section and you want to screen and look, identify the site of injection. You just take the slice, you look for the fluorescent beads, which are very fluorescent, and you have them in a variety of colors, so you can always choose what you want for the... And then you just know that this is injected mouse. Uh, this tells you that you, you really hit the right spot, and then you can... How you, long do they stay there? Forever. No, we didn't sec check forever, but they, they, they got stuck in. Uh, so they're very small, and they are micron. I think they just stay there, and they're inert. So, uh, so it's useful. So again, my, my two cents is that, and I try to show that echo is reproducible. It correlates well with invasive dynamics and MRI. Uh, but if you want to have this reliability and reproducibility and correlations, uh, you have to, to maintain uh, the standards. Uh, and and I, uh, the most important slide is actually to thank all the people that did this work, which was not me, and uh, especially Michael uh, Mutlak, uh, who did the gain of function, and uh, uh, Yair Lewis, who did this injection to the heart, and David Engelberg from the Hebrew U, and uh, funding, and uh, again, thank you. This I took this this Tuesday from my office window. Uh, uh, it looked like a nice uh, rainbow. Maybe it was a good sign or something, but we'll see. So thank you. <laughs>